All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the January 3rd Thursday Web Forum. This is our first webinar of 2017, so a very happy new year to everyone on the line. Um, my name is Hillary Morris. I work on Blueprint User Support and Communications for the South Atlantic LCC. Your cooperative hosts this web forum every third Thursday of the month at 10 a.m., and it serves as a great chance for you to ask any questions and provide feedback to help guide the conservation future of the South Atlantic. So no surprises here on the agenda for anyone who's yeah, a regular yeah. attendee. Um, we always follow the same agenda. Um, I'm going to go ahead and minimize our background noise now because I'm hearing a lot of static on the line. So does anyone need to speak up with a question or a comment before I put the whole conference in silent mode? <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. The conference is now in silent mode. That's better. So uh, this is our usual agenda. We start out by introducing the presenter. Um, we'll hear from our presenter for 30 to 40 minutes about our topic, and then there'll be plenty of time for Q&A and discussion afterward. We'll move on to some quick updates from South Atlantic LCC staff, and then there will be more time for questions and an open discussion at the end. So before I hand things off to Rua, um, just remember that if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box during the presentation, or if you want to speak up, at any time, just press star six to unmute your line. All right, so presenting today, we have Rua Mordecai, who, as you probably know, is the science coordinator for the South Atlantic LCC. And he's going to be talking to us about the evolution of the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint as a great setup for our upcoming round of workshops this spring. So, Rua, I'm going to go ahead and pass presenter power over to you to get us started. And just remember star six to unmute when you're ready to go. All right, can you hear me? I can. You're a little quiet. Okay, how That's about now? Better. better? Yeah. All right, excellent. Okay, give me one second. Let's get this started. Okay, can you see the slides? Sure can. All right, excellent. Hey, everybody. Uh, so, like Hillary said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the the evolution of the South Atlantic Blueprint going back from the beginning and then moving into um, a little bit about next steps and into the workshops coming up in a few months. So let's get into it. In the beginning, uh, back, I think the biggest beginning of the Blueprint, even as a kind of a word and a, a major organizing idea, started out in the strategic plan for the South Atlantic back in 2012. Um, and even in every folks that I see on the line were, were even part of that strategic planning effort, you might have remembered. Um, you know, the whole plan came from everybody putting in and surveys and, and meetings. You know, what do you want your cooperative to do? What do you not want your cooperative to do? Um, and one of the big things that came out of that is we struggled with, you know, what kind of a unique niche and what, what's a big thing that we can do together as a cooperative, particularly in the first three to five years. Uh, the emerging sort of overarching theme and what became the three to five year mission was creating this shared blueprint for conservation actions for sustaining natural and cultural resources. So really wanted to get something that didn't sound like the, the near term mission for every other organization out there. And so that unique niche was kind of a big overarching thing that started back in, in 2012. And there were a few key parts of that blueprint, uh, setting up, identifying some indicators, some shared measures of success for us to see if we're getting where we want to go, um, some kind of pulling those together to see how the, the sport is the state of the South Atlantic, how are our ecosystems doing. And then finally, the conservation blueprint itself. Uh, so this is really in the beginning, what does a blueprint even look like? How do we put it together? Those were questions we were all, um, including a bunch of folks that are on this webinar right now, we're all trying to figure out together. Uh, so here's a bit of a timeline we'll follow through. So <clears throat> coming out of that strategic plan, first thing we did was, was uh, identify some some indicators. So they were approved back early in 2013 um, and the process to, to fix them and improve them because we knew it wasn't going to be perfect. Um, and so that was the first step. Uh, those indicators were revolving around the integrity of natural resources um, and cultural resources in the different ecosystems of the South Atlantic. So your forested wetlands, your marine, um, your, your pine and prairie, these broad systems and a, and a small set of indicators to, 
to be able to measure how they were doing. So there are mixes of things like forested wetland bird index and um, riparian buffers and, and those kind of measures. Uh, and when we first did them, we, we, we had our key criteria that we still stuck to. We wanted to make sure we could, we could measure them, model them with current data, track them over time. A lot of great indicators but um, out there, but we can't kind of measure and track all of them right now. Um, and we also wanted them to be able to indicate other things. It was kind of a no-brainer at first, but of course we had to make sure they weren't just, they were indicating something other than themselves. Um, so that is our, that's the structure, natural resources around more ecosystem condition pieces and the integrity of cultural resources. Um, so this is really more about how people in history fit into this natural landscape. So things like uh, land cover around uh, important historic sites on the historic register is a good example of one of the, the cultural indicators. Uh, so we had our indicators, uh, we had some, some criteria, and when we first picked them, it was just, you know, we thought we'd be able to measure them based on our best guesses. We move forward. Uh, we attempted to do a state of the South Atlantic. Okay, what are their indicators telling us about the system? And we very quickly learned that uh, we took a little bit too big of a bite uh, of that. And so for some metrics, we were able to actually do some things. They weren't as easy to interpret as you can see from the earlier graph. This is one of our the ones that we had the best information on things like impervious surface. And we tried to do a little bit of everything. We wanted to do past and present and future. We wanted to look at our our targeted levels we were shooting for and whether we were going to reach that. And for some, like, you know, impervious surface, we were able to do it. For most, it was way harder than, than we had originally thought. Um, and so between the challenges of not having all our indicators modeled and just the challenge of communicating that much information, we took a shot at it, made some drafts. Some of y'all saw that as we came forward, um, but realized, boy, we need to really have some focused effort, time, and maybe a little professional help in putting together something cohesive. So we attempted that even back in 2013, um, and then moved to Blueprint 1.0. Uh, so that was the very first version of the Blueprint, um, had that approved back in 2014. Uh, it was mostly expert-driven around HUC-12 watersheds. We had some indicator data. We had changed future change information um, and data on existing plans, and we tried to merge them all together, but a lot of the engine was um, more of an expert-driven kind of process of, of identifying uh, key places to focus. So that was that was one fairly course, the first cut, but really helped get people an idea of like, oh, what could this look like and what might it emerge? All right, so that was 1.0. Um, clearly, I think from that process, a lot of people, you know, felt good about the big group decision making, but really wanted it to the blueprint to be more data driven than it was at the first cut. Uh, so that's why we immediately dove in worked on going through all our indicators, making sure we could model all of them, testing them to make sure they worked. Uh, and so coming out of Blueprint 1.0, we started working on revising the indicator. So back after, right around going into 2015, we had a revised set where we could model all the indicators and we could start moving to a more data-driven version. The first step in that was, all right, let's take our indicators and let's make a nice state of the South Atlantic. Let's try to make it in a way that's kind of broadly understandable, but again, data-driven. And that resulted in the State of the South Atlantic 2015, uh, which a number of you have also seen. Uh, so you can see we scored a C uh, based on, on those data. So this assessment, we look at the subregions of the this, this State of the South Atlantic and have letter grade scores um, across the whole region. But we also go into individual ecosystems and score them based on those indicators. So you can go in, you can see the scores, but also how you got the scores. If you want to go even deeper, you can all find the, the, the actual data and models and issues and kind of everything that goes into that. Uh, so that was our first cut at a, a kind of clean, understandable version of, of that. Um, and a number of you have seen it in other ways and even probably reviewed earlier versions in the Blueprint workshops for 2.0. So, State of South Atlantic, yay. We got our first reasonable version of that. And then we moved to the uh, data-driven version of Blueprint 2.0. And the way that was developed, and these are similar, basically same kind of methods that were used in, in future versions so far, 2.1 and, and into 2.2, is we took each of the different ecosystems um, of the, the South Atlantic, broadly defined kind of ecosystems. And then each of those, um, have their individual indicators with them. And then we combine, so first we look within ecosystems, we use a program called Zonation uh, to prioritize areas uh, based on indicator conditions. 
uh, to get integrity within each of those indicators themselves. Then we combine them together, the aquatic, the terrestrial, the marine, all stitch them together um, into a combined integrity layer. And then we use a uh, program called Linkage Mapper uh, to identify um, connections between large hubs of, of um, high integrity areas throughout the geography. Uh, so this is a least cost path kind of approach. And so those big hubs are, are big high priority areas um, it could be big protected areas, uh, but they may also be large private areas as well. So that's, once we get those hubs, we work on our corridors and then combine that all together. You get Blueprint 2.0. It also pretty much works for broadly talking about future versions as well. So that's how we get to our Blueprint priorities. And this was version 2.0. So the darker purple is the highest priority about um, 10% of the landscape, um, and you have next level down to highest priority, corridors, medium priority. So that was 2.0. Um, it was great to be able to move to a more data-driven version, um, so that was pretty exciting. Uh, it worked fairly well in, um, for some ecosystems, but it still had a number of issues, uh, like you'd expect for the first completely data-driven cut. Um, the biggest issues were around um, aquatics, freshwater aquatics, especially aquatic diversity, um, and the marine ecosystems and some coastal issues. Um, we're, we're pretty close on the terrestrial, um, but also on some corridors as well because of that intersection of terrestrial and aquatic. So yay data-driven, good on some systems, still needed some work and some others significant on the marine, significant on the aquatic side. All right, so that's Blueprint 2.0. We also made a, a couple of big um, leaps forward around some other issues related to the, the blueprint and implementing the blueprint itself. Uh, one big one was talking about um, change and things like urban growth and sea level rise and this idea of mutually reinforcing actions. And so um, the key thing about mutually reinforcing actions and thinking about how we can have a collective impact is that it's the most efficient way to make change is not necessarily every single organization and every group trying to work in the same exact acre of land doing the same thing. You know, we, we want to align all our work upstream and downstream so we can get those greater ecosystem impacts. But it's not necessarily about everyone piling onto the same place. It's how do our actions mutually reinforce each other to get the ecosystem outcomes we're looking for. Um, so that means that you know, different people have different parts of the strategy. And so we talked about the change. You know, how do we respond to urban growth? How do we respond to sea level rise? And this is a key thing, of course, in any kind of you know, plan for shared action in the face of change. Um, and so a lot of the plans, most of the plans you see and approaches take, take basically either downweight or exclude areas of change, exclude areas predicted to grow during, from, from urban growth and, and sea level rise. Uh, that's a classic way to do it. Um, but we wanted to put that to the larger community. So take that diverse group of hundreds of people that, that showed up to the Blueprint uh, 2.0 workshops and you know, take the Blueprint and look at places in the Blueprint that are predicted to change and, and ask that question as individuals. Okay, what part of the Blueprint do you, do you want to work on? Um, do you think it's important to even put higher priority in working in places that change? This is going to go urban, so we need to work there now. Um, that we call that a kind of high urgency, all the way down to the other spectrum, which we call low risk, which is these places are changing. We need to go to far away from areas that are going to be impacted by urban growth and sea level rise. Uh, so put that really hard question to the, the group, and we even, is in the bottom left you see here, and some of you will remember, we even did a chip voting exercise um, on what part you wanted to, to play. So here's what the results look like. Uh, so that green high urgency, that was, you know, we think, putting even more focus on areas predicted to change for conservation actions in the blueprint is, is, is important. Then we had what we call the baseline, which is, you know, it's going to depend on the ground conditions. Um, I'm, I, I don't want to rule out any of these places. They all have, um, depending on the situation, I might work in any one of them. Uh, we had a combination, you know, different responses to sea level rise and urban growth. And then we had lower risk, which is the blue. And one key message that came out of that, um, you know, this is kind of our best sample we have right now of, of of people's philosophical approach to responding to change. Uh, more than 80% of those involved continuing to, to do some kind of conservation action, in some cases incentives, wetland migration corridors, you know, working with urban communities kind of things, in areas predicted to change. Um, so this was kind of a clear message that the blueprint should continue to incorporate those places, actions in places that are changing. Um, 
but allow people to find their part of the blueprint. You know, if you're a low risk person, find your lower risk part that you can contribute to. So that was a big thing in, in the leap forward in Blueprint 2.0 and just thinking strategically about change. Uh, I, I think at least at the number of people tackling this question, I, I have not heard of any other situation or, or effort that's done this before. So that's pretty exciting to have these data to guide the Blueprint um, and start that discussion. Other big thing that started in Blueprint 2.0 was a, a, um, an implementation strategy. So, okay, yes, we've got this plan. How are we actually going to get this done and make change on the ground from it? Uh, and so the high-level components of the Blueprint 2 implementation strategy uh, had these three categories. It was promoting the Blueprint, uh, getting the word out so people kind of knew about it, supporting Blueprint use, uh, particularly for bringing in conservation, new conservation funds, or influencing organizational policy, you know, helping change, helping people work in more efficient ways, and then improving the blueprint itself, you know, getting the underlying data even better, so so we can be um, the blueprint itself best represents the highest priority areas for shared action. And this is the order of the priority. So this is the, when we started doing some buckets of how much how much the, the cooperative focus on each of these areas, the, the just general outreach to promote that really digging into Blueprint users and, and um, supporting directly and improving the data and information. So this is how it came out from the first version. We had Blueprint 2.0. The big focus, um, the highest priority was actually on getting the word out and just kind of letting people know, hey, this Blueprint's out there. Um, and then supporting Blueprint users. We started getting users and then improving the Blueprint. So that was the priority order uh, from the first implementation strategy, something we revisit every year. The other very cool thing that happened, you know, in that transition from Blueprint 1 and then into Blueprint 2 is we started getting a lot of folks using the Blueprint, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and this was after moving through Blueprint 2, uh, we, we talked about, came up with these three broad types of Blueprint use. Um, and so the first one, and still the most common right now, is really about amplifying uh, the impact of existing efforts. So how does, you know, how do we bring a landscape perspective to local actions. You know, how does this particular um, economic incentive program, or how does prescribed fire here at private lands, or how does this new acquisition parcel contribute to a, a larger strategy? Um, so it was it was bringing that in, and um, so that's, that's more of local what we have resources-wise, but also a big thing was trying to compete for some of these national conservation dollars and dollars wouldn't ne that wouldn't necessarily go to the South Atlantic. So that's a, a, a theme that continues on. Uh, so that's when we, that's, that's this amplify idea. And around that time, we got our first big win um, with the Wild and Fire Resilient Landscapes Program. You can see here in a picture of, of that and the South Atlantic proposal being the only one in the East that got, got funds. So this brought in, so far over a few years, that's brought in, um, I think we're at about $2 million and likely to, to keep going into the future um, of prescribed fire that wouldn't necessarily have been going to South Atlantic ecosystems. So that was one of our first big wins, um, will not be our last um, big, but for the blueprint bringing in new dollars. But it's exciting to keep that keep that rolling. So amplify, first big one. Uh, the next one was anticipating and planning for change. Uh, so I think Hurricane Sandy and the Gulf oil spill really got people thinking about: Are we ready to move quickly um, when when these disasters happen? And there's lots of resources and opportunities to build resilience into the system. Um, so that's that's been you know helping prepare for major disasters and also in land protection planning and these bigger strategies for for protecting land. Here's one example. This was um, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation um, looked to to the, the cooperative and we, we pulled together a, a group of folks um, for a proposal for a assessment of the Cape Fear River Basin, but also um, prioritizing hucks across the entire South Atlantic. Uh, so we helped connect a number of folks in the South Atlantic and, and myself and some of our staff in the South Atlantic helped work on this wildlife and habitat assessment for, for NIFWF. And so, uh, for example, on the right, those priority hucks, uh, the, one of the big backbones of that assessment that you're seeing is the uh, South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint. And so this was really to be ready for, you know, the next hurricane, the next big issue, and lessons learned from from Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and actually, some of the projects and results uh, already have been used in Hurricane Matthew response when, oh, there's a big hurricane, and wow, people are throwing around projects. Can we be ready quickly um, with some things to get done? 
So that's one of the examples from a anticipating and planning from change front. And then also, of course, the holy grail is, you know, adapting to change through conservation action. So this is finding those best places to work and implementing these bigger systems level solutions. Uh, one of the early examples that, that we used before um, relates to a, a dam removal. Uh, project where uh, this is actually um, so Mark Cantrell for for some of the you know um, he he worked mostly previously worked a lot in more pristine systems up in the Appalachians um, and looking at the, the the blueprint and and a few other layers um, zeroed in on on some spots out near um, Troy North Carolina on the Little, Little River um, where there was big opportunities for um, improving fish passage um, but weren't weren't necessarily the classic places he had worked before. So working in a slightly different place, uh, but but a new opportunity, and so they actually had some dam um, removals as a result of that, which is which is pretty exciting. Um, this is also a good example of, of a key thing about the blueprint is that the blueprint is never really the only tool you would use. There's always additional data and information that you would that that folks overlay. Um, and and bring to bear. So the blueprint is is one piece that shows how it fits into a bigger perspective, but it's never really the only piece that that goes into it. So yay, start to have some blueprint uses, have some broad types of how the blueprint is being used, and so that's pretty exciting. Uh, the other thing we've done um, that started a little bit in blueprint one, and then we really started refining in two is is improving the way people access data. So as staff, we help people use the blueprint. Um, but we also want to make sure it's easy for you all um, if you want to just access the information on your own. So we have two major viewers. Uh, so those really got refined over Blueprint 2.0. Our conservation planning atlas, which gets at all the different, you know, accessing the data layers. You can more interactively layer on stuff and, and do fancier stuff. And then our simple viewer, which we got feedback from a lot of our users, is they wanted something more like a Google Maps for conservation. You know, not all the different layers and complexity of a um, more advanced viewer, but but something fairly simple that they could sort of zoom in and, and see you know, where the partner opportunities, how's the landscape changing, what does the blueprint indicator say about those places. Um, so another big progress. And then when we're at version two, uh, about three years since we said we wanted to have a, uh, a con our mission was to create a conservation blueprint three to five years. In three years, looked at the mission and said, hey, okay, we got one. We're going to keep improving it, but Okay, we made it. Uh, so the mission then changed, updated. Um, so three years later, the mission um, got updated to facilitating conservation actions uh, guided by a shared adaptive blueprint. Um, so now it wasn't about creating the blueprint. It was let's facilitate some actions guided by this blueprint. So that was an exciting change. That's the current mission of the cooperative um, now as well. So that was 2.0. And since then, now we've been basically going on this process of uh, improving the indicators, improving the blueprint, improving the indicators. Uh, one thing you don't see on here is the next state of the South Atlantic, which right now is planned um, to be into sometime in 2018, so it's a little bit off this image. Uh, but this will sort of show you the, the flow of just um, you know listening to users, seeing what's working and, and bringing in new dollars and, and seeing what, what can be improved, improving it, and then moving forward. For 2.1, um, I think I mentioned this a little bit before, we made some big improvements in, in the areas where in, in workshops and, and for our users, we've gotten the biggest feedback on places that need improvement. So made some big improvements on the freshwater aquatic side, uh, including for imperiled aquatic species, uh, made some big improvements in the marines, and also in uh, urban areas and our urban open space indicator. And we continue to do that working with the American Planning Association right now. Here's an example of some improvements in our, our indicators. Uh, we're always testing the indicators, as I mentioned, to make sure they're indicating other things and working as they're supposed to. Uh, what you see on the left is one of our indicators we knew wasn't working as well, although in theory it sounded like it would work. Um, on the left, you see Blueprint 2.0 version performing poorly. On the right, 2.1. And what this is doing is on the bottom axis, you have point level sampling of benthic invertebrates throughout the South Atlantic. So this is actual on the ground monitoring stuff versus on the y-axis you see the riparian indicator. And so what you want to see, these are kind of box and whiskers plots. So you want to see a trend where the riparian indicator is typically lower in poor <laughs> um, benthic invertebrate um, 
indexes by index integrity and, and typically higher when it's good, so from left to right. So um, on the left, it's not really working very well. On the right, um, it, it works a lot better, and so it's discriminating. It's not, it's not the only indicator that goes into things, but you want these things to track fairly well. So 2.0, it was older land cover, and it was 30 meter buffers around rivers, regardless if they had big floodplains or if they were small Piedmont headwater streams. And 2.1 um, is now updated land cover and accounts for the active river area. So it's different if you're in a big floodplain versus the smaller headwater streams. So that's just one example of improving the indicators and constantly testing these, these indicators, especially the GIS models based on point level monitoring data to make sure they work. Other big improvements for 2.1, uh, documentation. We focus a lot on trying to improve the, the documentation as, as more and more people have been looking closely at the blueprint. Uh, so all the inputs now, uh, the indicators and all pieces um, are, are fully documented and have known issues. So if you've been in there, uh, if you know anything, you know, any, any type of modeling effort you've been in, uh, nothing's ever perfect. And so each of these inputs, the indicators, blueprint, I uh, try to clearly identify and get them out on the metadata and information, the known issues. And sometimes these are broad, we're under-prioritizing this, or they can be very really specific. You might have been on an indicator team and you've been like, you know what, this the migratory fish index is saying that sturgeon are going up past this dam. And you know what, they're not, that's wrong. Well, when we go and check that out, that fairly specific comment ends up getting into the known issues as well. Uh, so that's, we really have been trying to tighten up that stuff. We can always keep improving it, but now we're, we're happy to kind of flush those pieces out. We also have a new PDF that we've been working on improving that combines all the methods. So if you just want one big report um, with pictures and, and something that's easy to digest in that way, uh, we've been we've got a new PDF that we've already have up in, um, and we're also going to keep improving that uh, just to, to work for the different ways that people want to access the information. I don't have this up here, but there's also, we're pretty close to a peer-reviewed publication on Blueprint 2.0. Um, that's pretty close to, to publication, just in some final revisions. And then data access, we're always improving the data access. One big thing that happened is we now have a single easy package with all the key layers. So no matter where you are, we've got a nice package, so it's pretty simple to download, get all the key stuff and documentation all together in one nice, pretty package. So that's been a big deal. Another big improvement with 2.1 uh, relates to uh, use in the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy. Uh, so this strategy was a request from uh, 15 state directors of the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. You can see the boundaries on the outside here. Uh, and the 12 agencies, federal agencies of the South, um, Southeast Natural Resource Leadership Group. Um, and the, the key kind of leads on this are the six LCCs um, that you see here in the pictures of the South. Uh, so those groups basically, the, the SAFWA and the Snurlig, those two groups uh, wanted this, this is a number of years ago, so yeah, we want this, this broader adaptation strategy. And we think the L our LCC network is the best forum to get this done, to make it happen, to see what it, figure out what it looks like and, and do it. And so that was pretty exciting. And as of, so for Blueprint 2.1 and as of last fall, we had our very first 1.0 version of a Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy Blueprint. And this is what it looks like. So you, dark blue is your areas of high ecological value. Um, light blue is the medium. You can see the green is the protect areas on top. And really, this was, um, this was to make sure that you can actually do a lot of the things we're doing with the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint, but do it when you're when you're cutting across LCC boundaries. When you want to think about it, you want to think about the, the entire South or maybe an entire state. Uh, so that way, um, we've got, we, we kind of came up a way working with key points of contact from those organizations uh, to integrate the equivalent blueprints across the Southeast, uh, which they're also calling blueprints, which is nice. Um, so we put them all together. And so this is something we're going to be updating every year as these blueprints get improved. And right now it has version 2.1. When we get to the next version, we'll, we'll update that into the strategy. So this is a great way if you want to kind of, if you're interested in stuff beyond the South Atlantic, um, that we can stitch this together. And really, we're building towards a, um, there's a lot of momentum now for an Eastern conservation adaptation strategy and some good potential momentum for doing this North America-wide and beyond. So 
great momentum here on that front. Then for the implementation strategy for 2.1, uh, the priority has switched a little bit. Uh, so at this point, uh, promote was the top priority for Blueprint 2.0, get the word out. And then when we came back and getting all the feedback and the steering committee met, uh, they decided to switch things up a little bit. And the, the end point was, these are all important components. So we'd spend time in all these different pieces. Uh, but the end result was um, actually, all right, we've talked a lot about the Blueprint. we got a lot of Blueprint users going on. We want to be more proactive. Uh, so let's spend more of our effort supporting Blueprint use and trying to move the needle with the Blueprint. Um, that'd be the highest priority. Next being improve the Blueprint and the next general promotion. So, you know, the difference here promoting the Blueprint, and there's you know, kind of blurry lines here, but in general promoting the Blueprint, going to meetings, talking about the Blueprint in general um, versus um, proactively targeting, you know, specific Blueprint users, helping them use it in their, their particular purposes. So that was the big switch for 2.1. And one of the things that that's meant since Blueprint 2.0, which it's only been about less than six months, it's been approved, um, has been more proactive targeting of user support. Uh, so a lot of our user support has been interactive, where we work with people on using the Blueprint and the indicators and, and help even write little, little sections into proposals and stuff like that. So now we've, we've started tracking national programs that are what I call underfunding the South Atlantic, looking at the funding history and seeing like where are there opportunities where in the South Atlantic we could be getting more money for conservation um, and, and trying to target those national programs. Uh, and a few major themes of being more proactive around urban conservation funding, kind of reaching out to some of the urban planners that we've been building um, connections to, uh, fire funding, looking for opportunities just like with the wild and fire resilient landscapes. Uh, trying to jump on those national fire funding opportunities where we can bring some more money um, and Gulf restoration support, you know, making those connections between um, actions and indicators and, and uh, you know, making that connection with Gulf restoration. Uh, so that's just a few examples of more proactive and, and that we've been able to do because we've had a little more of our time focused on supporting Blueprint users themselves. All right, so quick Going back here on the evolution, this was 1.0, expert driven. This is 2.0, that's version 2.1. So getting a little bit more detailed, improving the integration of the systems, constantly um, making things a little bit better. But a lot of key places and no-brainer areas, even going back to 1.0, are still there. So there's a lot of key places that show up no matter how you slice it. And now here's a quick chart of Blueprint use by those different versions you just saw. So uh, Blueprint uses going from version 1, 2, and 3. So the blue is uses that are complete. And in red are in progress. Uh, so for version 2.1, you know, we're not even, through, you know, we're, we're barely halfway through the year here. And so we have a lot of stuff that's in progress support that's not complete yet. Um, so these are examples generally. Sometimes they're one person. Sometimes they're a number of folks. Uh, that we're working with as, as staff um, sort of know about uh, where they want to use the blueprint often in, in the ways I'm talking about. They want to kind of you know, look at their land protection strategies and see, okay, is this the right, are, uh, is, are these the right places? Where can we best work together with folks? They're wanting to make a case for how um, new land acquisition or new um, economic incentives programs are going to fit into a larger strategy. They want to quantify that. You know, instead of just generally we're going to do good stuff, well, what is that actually going to do more explicitly as far as outcomes and metrics and indicators? What are the watershed impacts? Those kind of things. So that is, is the, the track we're on for Blueprint use by, by version. The big summary here, uh, lots, of sum, lots of progress over the last few years. Um, we're seeing on the ground improvements from the blueprint, that but four question, uh, particularly around fire funding right now, um, but I think we're hopefully we'll be seeing some more on the ground improvements um, from, from a few other things that are in the works in the near future. Uh, but also, there's still plenty of work to do to move the needle for conservation in South Atlantic, and really that's the end game here. You know, the blueprint is a, a means to an end. It's not about just having the map. It's not about just getting people together. It's about moving the needle for conservation. Got a lot of big changes here. Uh, so there's still plenty of work to do. We set up, we're starting to get some good momentum. We set up some good avenues. And so into the future, we've got some, some good chances to start really making big change. All right, so that is the summary. 
now let's talk about the future. Uh, moving on from where we are right now. So for version 2.2, .2, the next update, this is a small update. That's because we're focusing mostly on the promote uh, the uh, support Blueprint user side of things, so a little bit less in the improve the Blueprint this time. Uh, so this, we're going on a small update. The original one was supposed to, 2.1 was supposed to be a small update. We, we got a little uh, overly excited and, and made some big changes because there were some good opportunities. Uh, but this one's going to be a little smaller. Uh, the, the biggest improvements you'll likely see are going to be hopefully in the marine environment once we get um, we can get the seabird indicator locked away, which is quite possible. Um, and some of the coastal ecosystems. Those will be some of the biggest improvement you've seen. But we're updating some other things. Um, our our um, resilient biodiversity hotspots indicators to, to match the most recently recent stuff coming out of Nature Conservancy and others. And we're also making more progress on action indicator models. Uh, so this is the stuff that comes in handy when you talk about, um, OK, well, what are we going to get out of prescribed fire in this particular place? And you know, what? What would um, you know if we if we do land protection on this particular parcel down near the Gulf? Well, what is that? What is that going to mean for ecosystem change and particularly into the Gulf Coastal and into the waters? You know, what does that mean for nutrient inflows and sediments? Where is it going to be? How is it going to change the ecosystems if we do this upstream? So we're we're starting to make more progress on those kind of action indicator models, um, incorporating them out for for all the different indicators. Um, so eventually, we hope to be able to do it for all the indicators. What does it mean for forest of wetland birds? What does it mean for amphibians? What does it mean for all these pieces? So that's 2.2. Um, the big thing, next big thing, is the workshops coming up, if you haven't seen. Uh, so these are the dates and times. Uh, last time, we did three locations and, and two per location. Now we're spreading it out even more. Uh, now we're doing six different uh, locations, one day each. So they should be pretty easy. The, guy, the idea here is that you should be able to, um, where, no matter where you're on the South Atlantic, you should be able to drive or fly in, 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 you know, in the morning and leave in the afternoon and leave at the same time, get back at the same time, not to have to spend the night or officially travel no matter where you are. So you spread these out pretty good across the geography and tighten them up uh, so, so you'll be able to get in and out, um, ideally at no cost to you, which is, which is great. And a big thing about these workshops and the cooperative in general is is really the the sort of this, this all of us coming together. You all really help drive the strategic direction, the content of what of what this cooperative does, where we all go, what we do collectively. Um, so the blueprints are a fun chance to get together and, and do this in person, guide you know work together on some specific things guide the, the future of the South Atlantic ecosystems. Uh, so that's, that's throughout all of this, you know, the major decisions, the major stuff, the major credit goes to, you know, all, all of you on the phone. In fact, a lot of you have been involved for quite a long time. So this is, this is pretty cool stuff. So that's, that's, uh, that's a critical part of these workshops. And the big questions coming up in these workshops, the first one, the top level one, Really, it's the end game. How can we best improve the condition of the South Atlantic ecosystems? You know, it's, it's the processes, it's the, the fish and wildlife populations. How do we best improve the, the, the condition of the South Atlantic? That's, that's the end game. And, you know, the subset question is how can your cooperative in general, how can it help? And so some of the stuff we'll be doing, we'll be reviewing Blueprint 2.2. Okay, where are the issues? What needs to be a known issue? What can we improve? Um, you know, how, is, how is this working? We'll be doing some more detailed blueprint implementation strategies by subregion, bringing forward some of the, the work that's already been done in existing plans. So if you contributed that, we'll try to bring that forward. And we're going to be talking in smaller subregions of the, the South Atlantic um, about how we actually get this done. You know, what do we need? Do we need to target? You know, okay, LWCF funds here. Do we need to target organizational policy that's getting in the way in this region of the sort of north coastal plain? Do we need to work on a few really big ecosystem restoration projects that we can't do on our own with this individual funding source and this funding source? So maybe we should roll these up together. Um, so that kind of level of like, how do we get this stuff done? Um, and uh, so in those subregions, uh, we'll be talking about the one-year vision cycles. You've been seeing it. We're on this one-year vision cycle. Improve the indicators. Improve blueprint. Improve the indicators. Critical at the very beginning. As we move forward, there are some trade-offs. 
Um, there are goods and bads about doing a one-year revision cycle. Um, and so this is a good check-in with the broader cooperative community and the broader cooperative, which is all of you listening here. Um, on do you know do we keep going on this cycle and so we'll talk about pluses and minuses and then y'all get to decide uh, and then at the end we'll do chip voting again um, and we'll be talking about again these elements support improve promote you know support and blueprint uses improve the blueprint you know promoting reaching out to new audiences getting new people involved what's the balance for the next year so we'll be voting on that and shifting so for the next year what are we going to what do we want to work while what's the what's the top thing to do um, what's what are the big barriers and, and how do we move forward those are the big questions for the workshop uh, you'll be tackling so they, they've been pretty fun good good diversity of folks there in the past and with that I am going to leave up these blueprint dates and locations just in case you were scrambling to write them down they're on the website too um, leave them up for you and take any questions yeah, plenty of time for questions, so don't be shy. Just remember, if you want to speak up, star six to unmute, or you're welcome to use the chat box. Someone's got to have a question because we just like shattered our web forum attendance record and I know with everybody <laughs> on the line and a complete unabridged history of the blueprint, someone has to be curious about something. I have a question. Oh, yeah, go for it. Hey, um, this is Brian Crawford from the University of Georgia. Um, yeah, great summary, Ru. Thanks for taking us through all that. Um, I guess my question, something that was mentioned in the beginning, but you didn't really elaborate too much on, was the evolution of like your cultural resources indicators. I know that is probably a big thing to tackle, but I wonder if you could comment a little bit about that process and where it's going. Oh yeah, definitely. Hey, Brian. So, um, yeah, that's a great question. I would say so. In general, you know, we've made good progress. Not as much as we have on the natural resource indicator side. Uh, the evolution um, started with you know as we developed the cultural indicators, a lot of um, interviews with cultural resource professionals managed to get cultural resource folks to some of the workshops. And you know, one of the key components that that came out from a lot of that feedback is trying to integrate the natural and cultural together as more of a cultural landscape and as part of a system. Um, and so what we've tried to do is instead of keeping them two separate, but try to bring them together. Um, so we kind of, we have an ecosystem and you have multiple indicators, natural and cultural per system. Um, so that was one thing that came out of that. Uh, some of the big ones that we have that have been the major cultural anchors so far has been um, these sort of the, the low urban historic sites. So this idea of cultural context, you have these important historic areas and battlefields and cabins and a lot of the importance of, um, from a historical interpretation side, is when those areas are surrounded by their historic ecosystems and their historic condition, uh, that really helps a lot from the, it's really critical for the interpretation side of things. So we have this sort of percent natural habitat around conditions. Um, that brings in some of a cultural perspective. Uh, longleaf, so another one, um, Longleaf, uh, acres of Longleaf uh, came in actually, not even so much from a natural resource side, but from a cultural resource side, from the importance of the history of Longleaf. Um, so it was discussed as an indicator in the, in the, um, on the natural resource side and actually rejected for a few reasons, but came back in on the cultural side. Uh, and the other big one that we've made some good progress on is um, going to be making more is, is things like the Urban Open Space Index. Uh, so in that place, um, we're bringing in the urban open space, but uh, it's not just urban open space in general, um, but there are some components of it that are all about equity of access for different, different communities to that ur urban open space and how people interact with, with that and some of those provisioning services. 
Um, so I think there are some on the urban community side, some on the historic side. And it's interesting, like bringing back on the historic side, some of the overlaps that happen. Uh, one big one came with prescribed fire. And um, one of the big interpretive issues you have in some of these areas in the longleaf ecosystem around these historic areas, um, particularly where, where they were key hubs for slavery, is that when the, the longleaf system grows up and is not well maintained and you sort of get thick and understory, um, you actually lose that context of how hard it was for a lot of the slaves to escape from the compounds. Um, and so, you know, that's the sort of that sense of hopelessness when you're in these areas, you're surrounded. I mean, you've, most of you have seen a really nice maintained longleaf system. You can see for miles in that open understory. Um, but when you start losing the condition of that system, you know, when you put buildings in there, when you get overgrown, you've lost the historic context. So there's some interesting overlaps. Um, and the evolution really has been not quite as fast as some of the natural sides. Um, but we've tried to keep that view and have been iterating it over um, over time. And there's some other things we've been exploring, even in the marine environment on the sort of archaeological side. Um, and the big leap that's been working on, there's a project going on supported by the Climate Science Center uh, out in Cape Lookout, uh, where we've been working on digging into some of these historic register sites and historic sites to start coming up with different types of cultural resources and, and typologies and um, and ways of responding to change that are specific to cultural resources. Um, and so as that project's getting, getting close to a close, we're going to try to bring some of the lessons learned that came out of this focus on historic um, communities out in Cape Lookout and then see how well we can adapt that cultural resource approach to the South Atlantic as a whole. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. That was a great question. Mm -hmm. um, Louise, did you have a question? Oh, I was just going to say, Hillary, how much fun are these workshops that are coming up? Oh, they're so fun. <laughs> they and are I hope, so fun. I hope other people on the line who've been to past workshops can speak to uh We're not trying to lock you guys in a windowless room and wring knowledge from you until <laughs> you crawl out the door. Um, at the end of the day, we have a, we have a lot of fun. Um, we take breaks. We eat lunch. We drink coffee. And we... Uh, spend some great time, you know, working with other folks passionate about making a difference for conservation in the South Atlantic. So uh, definitely would love to have you turn out. Um, thanks for mentioning that, Louise. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question on the chat box from Robert Truesdale asking about access um, to the data from different sources that you mentioned, like the benthic and vertebrate IBI uh, that was used to test the riparian buffer indicator. Um, and its raw counterpart, like the benthic and vertebrate count, same for amphibians. Um, I might just say briefly, Robert, that all of the um, indicator data is available on the Conservation Planning Atlas. So uh, touching on amphibians, the priority amphibian and reptile conservation areas that make up the um, pine and prairie amphibian and the forested wetland amphibian indicators, that's all available. And I might let Rua speak to some of the data sets that we've used for testing and validating those indicators? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll walk you through um, a few of these, uh, through those questions. So for, for data that goes straight into the indicators, this is the Conservation Planning Atlas here. Um, so you go on the right, access Blueprint 2.1 data. So here's all the different pieces, the maps, the indicators, the, the integrity scores. So if you want to drive into any of these individual indicators, um, we have for each of these, um, we have the particular here's for so wetland birds and amphibians. Um, up on the right here, you see this description and click more. We have, OK, what is it? Why is it selected? We have all the input data, so links to the sources, where the steps are, here are the mapping steps, any known issues like I mentioned before, um, and any literature cited. So we have the pieces in here of um, documented. And so if you can't find it for, for some reason, you think something missing, let us know, because we're always kind of using our own. We have questions internally to make sure the documentation is publicly available. Um, so this is, so for the actual stuff that goes into it, what is it, what are its issues, how to get it, that's where you get this one. Now, the stuff we've used for testing, um, so that's another s story the way we have it together. Um, in the future improvement, we have actually talked about putting the validation in those indicators step two. We haven't done it yet, um, but that's something we're looking at doing. So have the validation data and that documentation in there as well. Um, for right now, to look at the validation stuff, if you go to the South Atlantic page, 
you go to the indicators page and there's a sort of more detailed roadmap for the indicators. Where have we been? Where are we going? We have the ecological, practical, and social criteria testing. So any testing we've done, um, this has the results and documentation for how we did things and where we did it. So in this case, results of the 2015, this is the most recent one that I showed. Um, so in this case, we have um, kind of how we did it, methods, where the data came from, um, and tried to be very specific to the point where we, you could replicate it specifically. So this is the EPA Rivers and Streams Assessment. This is the data we used for the benthic invertebrate. And then basically try to be very specific. OK, here we use the benthic multimetric index. Here's exactly what it is in the, in the spreadsheet. Here's exactly how we did it. Um, uh, so if you can't find that, um, yeah, let me know, Robert, if you can't find some of those, those uh, specific details on on the sets because we're always looking to improve um, improve that, especially for folks like you that are like, where'd you get that data set? Or well, I'm gonna go find that, try it out myself. Um, but that's how we're, that's how we've been kind of pulling it together here, the testing documents. We're And so we're in the mix of kind of trying to merge these together so you can kind of get a, a one-stop shop for, for all of them. He's also following up to say, um, for folks who might want to contribute, validation data as well as mm -hmm. access validation mm -hmm. data. Do you have any standard formats or any particular data sets that you might be looking for? Mm, yeah, that is a great, that's a great idea. You know, we started operationalizing the validation sets even more and been reaching out. We don't have a structured approach to do that other than send me an email and we'll work on it. Um, I mean, the, the formats, you know, a lot of our validation stuff we've been focusing on has been point level monitoring kind of stuff. Um, but we validate with other data sets as well. Um, so, yeah, I think the, right now it's just, yeah, send it to me an email and we can work on it. Um, but what I'll do, uh, we'll kind of add this to a suggestion for future uh, things to work on. Um, because we've been trying to really tighten up the, the validation steps. So anytime we update things, we've got a nice, clear kind of way of demonstrating, finding out whether it's really working in the way it's intended. Uh, so I'll put that as a follow-up step um, and a suggestion out of this out of this group to, to follow up on. Awesome, thanks. Um, one more question out of the chat box. Is there a list or can you talk about any additional indicators that you might include in the future? Um, I think uh, thinking ahead to 2.2, particularly for the estuarine and marine areas that you mentioned. Yeah, so we're always, as, as you know, we're always trying to find ways of improving the indicators we have right now. Um, so um, one of our, our kind of research fellows, uh, Simeon Yurik, uh, who actually worked on a lot of the, the Everglades restoration and connections to estuaries and has some strong background in marine and estuarine systems, is, is working on uh, helping on a number of different fronts. Uh, I would say on the estuarine and marine side, um, we've got some new, some new um, data that's very close to coming out on different types of salt marsh that connect really well with some of the oyster um, habitat models and conditions. Uh, so we're hoping we might be able to get something pretty good, um, probably not for 2.2, but for the next version after that. Um, we're hoping to have something better on improvements of our how we deal with, with salt marsh and um, mudflats and, and kind of uh, oyster habitat condition. Um, also, yeah, working on nearshore and offshore pieces. We've got a, a project right now working with a bunch of folks um, that are part of the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council on an, on an eco space, eco sim um, kind of a, a approach to, to management that's that's doing a full food web um, ecosystem model that we're going to try to, hopefully we should be able to bring in more of the fishery component in the near future. So that is in the works. Uh, this, the new seabird models um, are really close. I think we're going to be able to get those into 2.2. Um, and then um, hopefully some more stuff, even on um, you know things like sturgeon and uh, a few of the improved sea turtle models and other things. So there's a lot of stuff on the horizon um, on the, the coastal stuff. I think especially the open water and the estuaries needs a lot of work. So we're doing some good stuff on on habitat and trying to look at sort of uh, nutrient fluxes, particularly because. Uh, you know, the, as, as you know, if you're answering that question, you know, the estuaries and the marine environments are a little bit different and a little bit more dynamic in, in, in thinking about, you know, fronts and, and what's driving productivity. Uh, so Simeon's going to be with us. Um, you know, he's, he's 
it's kind of a two-year thing. He's been in here only a few months. Uh, so we're expecting some big improvements, um, I think, coming out of some of those investigations uh, in a little bit in this next version, 2.2, and some bigger ones coming up in the next, the next one. Thanks for that question, Connie. It might be a good blog post to talk about some of these um, indicator, future indicator updates. Um, I think kind of the short list for 2.2, you know, we're updating um, resilient biodiversity hotspots to the most recent Nature Conservancy data. We're um, going to be updating some of our unaltered beach indicator to capture new additions to the coastal barrier resource system uh, data set. And like Ruiz said, trying to bring in the seabird models, and I'm going to touch on briefly in our staff update slides here in a second, uh, ways to contribute to that seabird indicator review if you're interested in that. Um, the last comment that I think just for time that I wanted to share, appreciate a shout out to John Kaufman uh, out of Virginia saying that CCAS has been a great contribution in his area since Virginia actually has three LCCs within its state boundaries, um, which caused some concern about having different priorities in the same watershed and getting that seamless integration. So I definitely appreciate that comment. Glad that, that CCAS is filling that niche since most states do have multiple LCCs within their boundaries. And for folks who think at the state scale, that, that seamless CCAS blueprint um, is helping to address that. So I'm going to take back presenter power here just so I can wrap up with some staff updates. So bear with me real quick. So um, quick preview of next month's web forum. This is going to be a really interesting one, especially for anyone who is a, into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so the next web forum is going to be February 16th. Uh, next month, or Thursday. Um, we'll actually be using different connection information, just so be aware. Um, we'll be using the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks LCC's connection information through GoToMeeting, and you do need to register in advance for this webinar just so we can get a handle on attendance. So that's the link at the top um, for that registration information, and you can also get it on the, um, the web event on the South Atlantic LCC website, and it'll go out in the reminder email in a few weeks. But just a heads up, um, we'll be hearing from a few different presenters on this webinar. John Turpak with the Fish and Wildlife Service Gulf Restoration Program, uh, James Cronin, who's an ecologist with USGS, and then Blair Turpak, who's also with USGS and is the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC Geomatics Coordinator. So this is a project that's a joint effort between the four Gulf Coast LCCs, which includes the South Atlantic, and the Fish and Wildlife Service is involved as well. So it's part of an overarching vision for a healthy Gulf of Mexico watershed. And the goal of this project was to develop explicit biological objectives for the Gulf, as well as associated conservation targets that are linked to specific habitat characteristics, and then to combine all of that in a geospatial database. Uh, so in other words, this project has really generated a common set of objectives that all partners working in the Gulf can share and build on. Um, so these folks will be presenting the results of that project, and I think it'll be an awesome webinar for anyone who's interested in Gulf of Mexico issues. Um, quick staff update. I uh, mentioned that seabird indicator review. Um, if you are knowledgeable about seabirds, please do sign up to review this new indicator. You can fill out a SurveyMonkey poll, um, which you can access on the top featured blog post on the South Atlantic LCC website right now, um, or you can just email Rua directly, and there's his email address. Uh, did you want to add anything to that, Rua? No, I think this is just basically the typical way we we uh, review and make decisions about um, improving indicators and, and adding new indicators. So it's a you know very very light load on, on your time. You know one to two hours total for the your whole effort. Great. So uh, please don't hesitate to sign up for that if you're interested. Um, as always, here's how to get more involved. Please join the South Atlantic LCC website. Uh, you'll get a reminder email about this web forum as well as our monthly newsletter. Um, particularly if you're interested in workshops, this is a great way to be sure that you don't miss uh, the draft agenda, the registration link, um, although all of that will be just on our website as well. You can always talk to staff or other members of your cooperative. Uh, that's why we're here. <clears throat> and then, of course, please do explore the blueprint online um, through the CPA, through the Simple Viewer. You can learn more about it on the website. Um, so that's really all I have. It's about 11 o'clock, so... Um, you're welcome to sign off if anyone had any last-minute questions or other things they wanted to discuss. Um, please feel free to speak up, star six to unmute. All right, thanks everybody for joining. Really appreciate you showing up. Thrilled with the participation today. Um, get excited about the workshops. Hope to see you at one. Um, and hope to see you guys next month as well for the next web forum.
Thanks, everybody. Hope to see you soon.